Good evening. My name is Shin Yi Pai and I'm the program director at Town Hall. On behalf of the staff at Town Hall Seattle and our friends at Third Place Books, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our talk tonight with Justine Bateman. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. We're so glad to have you join us tonight. The presentation will run about 60 minutes, including Q&A. To submit your questions for the Q&A portion of the event, please enter meet.ps backslash Bateman or scan the QR code right now on the screen with your smartphone. We'll drop this link in the chat and remind folks where to go when we get to Q&A. We can't guarantee that we'll be able to address every question, but we will try to get to as many as possible. You can help us by keeping your own question concise. For those of you who would like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming events include Lead Pencil Studio with Gary Fagan discussing their recently unveiled public artwork at the U District Light Rail Station and past public art projects. And Katie Eyes with Allison Williams talking about imaginary peaks, the recent Steen hoax and other mountain dreams. Visit our website to join our email list and get the latest updates as more programs are added throughout the season. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. As part of our Arts and Culture series, this event is supported by Four Culture, Arts Fund, City of Seattle Arts and Culture, and Washington State Arts Commission. Town Hall is also a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members who are joining us from home. If you share in Town Hall's goal of a community energized and empowered by considering questions of politics, science, and culture, please consider supporting us by becoming a member. You'll find membership information on our website. Lastly, you'll absolutely want to dig into tonight's topic by purchasing your own copy of the author's book. Please use the link in the chat below to pick up your copy through Third Place Books. Justine Bateman is a director, producer, and author with an impressive decades-long resume in film and TV that includes Family Ties, Satisfaction, Arrested Development, and many more. She earned a Golden Globe nomination and two Emmy nominations. Her previous book, Fame, was published in 2018. Justine's writing has also been published by Dame, Salon, and McSweeney's. Justine's new book, Face, One Square Foot of Skin, is the subject of this evening's talk. Please join me in welcoming Justine Bateman. Um, applause, applause. Hi, it's weird to do this without seeing all of you. I've, I've never done, this is my second book, and I, I um, of course, did the book tour for, for Face, virtually but it was all interviews and stuff it wasn't um like you know with an audience so I'm sorry I can't see you and I can't gauge uh whether your interest is waning or not as I'm talking which is useful when you're doing talking to a bunch of people um so like and there's no way that I can even see no okay um all right guys so I wish there's a way to tell me if uh, way for me to guess if I should move on or not, but I'm just gonna assume that you are totally interested in everything I'm saying. Um, so this book, so this is uh, what well, you can see here. Um, so face one square foot of skin, it, it came out of um, uh, the writing of my first book, Fame, uh, the hijacking of reality, which is about the life cycle of fame. And if you're interested in what has gripped our society, you might like that book. Um, and there's, it's about uh, the life cycle of fame, the beginning, the the kind of the summit, the equilibrium, and then the the without, you know, when it fades away. And some people don't live that whole life cycle. I did, and it's what it's like from the inside, and then why the public is reacting the way it does at different points in that life cycle. Um, and it's also about how did we as a society get to this point? So while I was doing that, of course, I was looking myself up online because I, I needed to remember, I wanted to like sort of emotionally time travel for the reader. Um, and so I Googled myself, which is never a good idea. And the autocomplete was looks old. And I'm 55 now at the time I was, um, when I started doing the research and stuff, I was early forties and, uh, and I was like, wait, what? And it messed with my head. I'm just gonna read you the introduction. It just, and once I got on the other side of that, I was like, wait, but there's, okay. So I've just gotten on the, on the other side of that but there's something going on in society as a whole that is 
you know, hopefully we, we can get on the other side of that too. Okay, so I'll read, I'll read part of this introduction. Okay, when I was a smooth skinned and plump, uh, I'm gonna need these. Okay, when I was a smooth skinned and plump faced teenager, I really wanted to look like the older European actresses I saw in the Italian and French films of the 1960s and 70s. Chiseled cheeks, dark circles under their eyes, loose skin on the jawline, crow's feet framing the eyes. To me, these facial markings were the hallmarks of complex and exotic women. Women with confidence and attitude and style. Women who had no use whatsoever, no use for whatever you might think of them. Unfortunately, I was too young to have any of these interesting characteristics on my face. I longed for Jean Moreau's under eye bags, Charlotte Rampling's sharp, sorry, sharp cheekbones and hooded eyelids, and Anna Magnani's deep and dark creases extending down from the inner corners of her eyes. I felt that if I had a face with those markings, people would immediately know that I was interesting and complex. There would be no question. Then I, I then grew older and I became more myself with more of the traits I had admired about those older actresses. As luck would have it, my face changed accordingly. I was elated when creases emerged across the tops of my cheeks when I smiled, when I saw the promising beginnings of small bags under my eyes, when the skin loosened on my neck. One summer, I even noticed the real bonus of cleavage creases on my upper chest from the sun. I was finally beginning to look like the kinds of women I thought were the most interesting and the most attractive. Well, you can imagine uh, how surprised I was to find that many people disagreed. I was taken aback to find that quite a few people had taken to the internet, to internet chat sites to passionately complain that Justine Bateman looks horrible now. How was it possible that they didn't see what I saw in my face, the indication of a complex and exotic woman? How could it be that they saw the, the opposite of what I saw in my face? This was confusing to process, and you can read more detail about that nauseating experience from my book, Fame, The Hijacking of Reality. But on the other side of that process, I wanted to understand just how that passionately negative perception of an older woman's face exists in our current society. Millions of, older, millions of other women have been eviscerated in the same way I was, via the loud and verbal, loud and verbally violent criticisms of aging actresses, models, musicians, and politicians. The criticism filters down to all women, both in and out of the spotlight. For those in the spotlight, a panic can develop to surgically alter the aging face in an attempt to escape this older, terrible face criticism. For those out of the spotlight, there can be a bit of horror watching those who were once lauded as some of the most beautiful people among us, quote unquote, publicly ripped to shreds when their faces age. Some of the thinking follows that if those attractive people aren't exempt from the criticism and, and can now be drawn and quartered for looking older, what lies in wait for more ordinary faces? A special terror is transmitted to younger women, teenagers and girls, still, yet still years away from experiencing any facial wrinkles or loose skin themselves. They can clearly see that their trajectory in society, they can clearly see their trajectory in society as pigs to the slaughter. Every year they inch closer and closer to being attacked themselves for their naturally aging faces. After all, not a week goes by without a girl hearing comments about older women like, she used to be a looker, but now she's really let herself go. Or she looks like an old hag now, or good thing she married before she lost her looks, etc. Comments like these constantly reaffirm that the girl has worth with an unlined and pretty face, but once that goes, she will be led to the slaughterhouse like all the other older piggies. Unfortunately, when the girls look to older women to see whether or not, uh, whether they are folding under the verbal pressure, or if they are instead boldly defying it with self-confidence, the girls more often see older women folding and rushing to surgically fix their faces. With few confident older role models to counteract the noise about their faces, one can hardly expect a relaxed attitude from any young female about the prospect of eventually looking older. So, I mean, I think I was at an advantage when I was younger because I had, um, and maybe some of you are the same age as me. And I feel like we had a lot of older women to look at, you know, like uh, Elaine Stritch. I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Um, or uh, the way I was going to say um, Barbara Stanwyck, but I think she had a facelift near the end there. Um, but you get what I'm saying, like these, 
these older, to me, they were broads, you know, and I, man, I really wanted to look like, I, I wanted to be like them, you know, and that meant looking like them. Um, or looking at someone like um, uh, Georgia O'Keefe, like I'm like, yeah, that's, that would be awesome to look like her eventually. Um, and now I feel like we don't have so many of those, at least not in an obvious way, not in a, uh, not an in your face way. We don't have, um, we don't have a lot of older faces to look at, to, uh, to aspire to. Um, and I think that must be very terrifying for younger women. Uh, like I, like I said in here. Um, yeah, so basically I, I, I wrote the book. I mean, not only because I got on the other side of me, I had to get to what was the root fear. I mean, that's how I process everything. I, I go into that in, in fame. And, and also I have a film coming out online tomorrow called Violet that, that, exp that examines that more generally. Like when you're making fear-based decisions, you're not being yourself and it takes you off your trajectory, I, I found. And so if I can get to the reason I'm making the fear-based decision then and get rid of that fear, then, then I can think clearly about my situation. So face is an example of um, when I processed it, I had to get to my root fear. So the fear, uh, so the, the thinking is, oh, if, if someone thinks I look older then therefore, and there's some fill in the blank, right? So I believe everyone has a fill in the blank. They think, oh, people won't listen to me anymore, or I'll lose my job, or I won't get this job, or I'll, I'll lose my mate, or I won't get a mate. Um, and so I found for myself, and I think it's true for others, that that fear is what needs to be tended to. Not the skin on my face. There's nothing wrong with this. There's something wrong though that I fear that if people think I look older then therefore X will happen. It's the X that is the fear. So I found I had to just deal with those fears. And then once I did like my face, like sure I look, I mean, look my ring light broke before this. So I'm using like this desk lamp, you know and you can, you know, makes this like more pronounced and stuff. But like, so, so does that mean that you're all gonna turn this off? I mean, even if you did, maybe one or two stick around and then they'll be just more important. Um, in other words, my life gives me certain opportunities. My life gives me certain uh, situations and it doesn't care my gender. It doesn't care the state of my face. It just keeps offering me things. And then the choice in my life is am I going to uh, sort of go forward in those opportunities or am I gonna say, no, I can't because I look older. So then I have to ask myself, well, why would I be Xing myself out of my own life? Or why would I not be enjoying my own life? And not asking rhetorically, but I always ask like quite literally, I make myself like either say out loud to a friend or write it down. What is that irrational fear? that's making me like walk around sh feeling shame about my face. And, um, and I have to keep revisiting that, you know, I'll see new, you know, I don't know, like, uh, you know, the light catches, I go like, huh, that is, uh, <laughs> that's gonna stay there. And, and it'll get worse, right? As I get older, I'm sure, right? That's what, how it works. But then I go like, oh, well, that's what a cool neck looks like, you know? And if I were to fix it, like, so let's say I got a lift and I did that. I'd be fixing it for whom? So that I make sure that people who think, oh, she looks old, so I'm not gonna give her a job or whatever. Like, would I wanna work with that person anyway? <laughs> or I, I don't know, I don't think life works that way anyway. Okay, so that's why I wrote the book. And I thought, well, in my life, there are certain, um, fearful ideas, right, that caused uh, me, that served as anchors for this, uh, that allowed me to absorb what was being said about me online. Justine Bateman looks old, she looks like a crack whore, she looks like, oh my God, does she have cancer? You know, all, all of that, right? 
um, which I copied and pasted. Uh, there's one story called Donna. I get you. I should have done a table of contents. Um, anyway, you'll find it. It's called Donna. And she, this is a very famous actress, you know, way more famous than I was. Um, going back to her high school reunion. And she hears people talking about her. And I actually copied and pasted things that were said about me on a couple of um, uh, a couple of um, message boards. So everything you read there is what was said about me. <laughs> uh, okay, let me read. So, sorry, to get to the point I was making. So I had to look at what was my root fears, and then I thought, okay, society as a whole. You know, after I got through that, and I I just looked at it's society as a whole. What what is it about society that holds on to this idea that women's faces are broken and need to be fixed? And basically, whatever age they are, you'd be 20. It's like, well, your lips are thin. You need to fix that. Or, or you better do this and that to your face, you know, have a, some daily routine because you don't want to look like that or like this. Um, so I started thinking about that. And I, so these, uh, the format's 47 short stories, and I based it on, um, uh, experiences and feelings that I have uh, on the topic. And then those of about 20 people I interviewed. Um, and they were mostly women. There were a couple of men. Um, and some of these stories are, I would take one thing that somebody had said and put it together with something another person had said. Um, so uh, yeah, and it just gets to like, Maybe this is part of the reason. There's one story about a woman uh, who's exposed her children to all these, you know, all these fairy tales. Hans Christian Andersen and uh, the Grimm brothers, and um, and uh, and she realizes, wow, all the villains in these stories are old women, and and I'm not I'm not suggesting we get rid of fairy tales at all. In fact, I'm not suggesting anybody, I don't want to change anybody around me. I just want to change my, my buttons. I want to get rid of my buttons. I want to be able to walk through any criticisms, anything anybody else is saying, and just be like, oh, I'm sorry, what did you say? Like, just like not even hear it, not even care. So that's my objective. But it is interesting that perhaps just as a, you know, one theory that could be true, that we have subliminally absorbed through hearing all these fairy tales, that to look, to be female and look old equals evil. Just a possibility. And I think in discovering things like this, that could be possible reasons why it is solidified itself in certain people, I think that gives you an opportunity to reject it. Then you go, oh, well, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, but older women aren't evil, huh? Oh, that's weird. My brain made that connection, and then it'll allow you to let it go. Okay, I'll 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 read you a couple of these. Again, I'm sorry, guys. This is really weird to not be uh, with you in person and <laughs> um, kind of see your faces. Um, okay, so this is the first one. Tanya, 42, actress. The man drew a line with his finger from his mid forehead down to the bridge of his nose when he caught her eye. How long had he been trying to catch her eye? How long had he been thinking this? This admonishment of her, this warning, this helpful hint. From the other side of the camera, she furrowed her brow, causing his anxiety to rise, she was sure. When she looked back later, she was sure. Other people moved around her, working, setting the shot. She was an island, looking at this man on another island, and she saw him too clearly. No ocean haze to block her gesture. Again, this ge his gesture, again, her brow furrow, her, huh? Then his finger wagging back and forth, once, twice. Oh, don't fur your brow, don't crease your skin, don't move your forehead. That was this gesture, the monotone wagging of his finger. The cinematographer on this TV show was bothered that she was using her forehead or angry that she was creasing it, or confused as to how to light a forehead like this, she supposed. A forehead that had not known the puncture of a needle and the insertion of paralyzing toxins. A forehead that could still express confusion and contempt. She wanted to make a scene. 
wanted to make a scene for all the fashion magazines divesting themselves of the former plastic surgery stigma of years past, and now instead pumping out article after article about plastic surgery in a matter of fact way, making 20 year olds and 50 year olds, and it doesn't matter your age, adopt some assumption that everything in your face needs help. All that skin on your head, not covered in hair, needed something, an injection, a filler, an abrasive scrub, a cut and sew, a remedy. Then she thought about all the face cream commercials on television, speaking to women, almost always speaking to women in a helpful tone. We're just trying to help you, don't worry. We're just trying to help you not be seen in the hideous state you're currently presenting. Everywhere you go, people notice. They notice that you've failed. You've failed to maintain your looks, your appeal. Yes, we know you've raised a family on your own or gotten your PhD or are running a large company, but let's be honest, none of that matters unless you have a fatigue-free, youthful looking face. It just won't matter but we're here for you. We can get you on the other side of the whispers behind the hand comments or that, hey guys, I don't mean any offense. I mean, I really like her, but have you noticed she's looking a bit jowly, a bit old now? We're on your side. She kept calm, calm for her. Out loud though, she had to say something out loud. What, don't crease my forehead? He nodded affirmatively, relieved almost that she understood his note. Well, it's not gonna happen, she said flatly. She wanted to vomit. No sickness, nausea, stomach issue, just an emotional relief gesture, just vomit as a substitute for all the other things she wanted to say. God damn it, a bit, a tiny bit, a little bit of panic now. She had never heard that before, never that note. This show though, most all of the other actresses on the show had toxic injections, partially paralyzing their facing faces, disallowing their facial impulses from damaging their faces or putting them in a position to get comments to have people whisper about them. Yes, maybe the cinematographer was confounded having not lit or photographed a moving forehead in so long, confused about accommodating this anomaly. That note, she didn't wanna think about it. I'm strong, I look fine. He just doesn't know, he's, he's too used to all the fakery. He just doesn't know. But she was thinking about it. It was in her stomach now, trying to lick her mind, trying to force its way up her throat and coat her mind with its spit while she was trying to concentrate on acting in the scene. Trying to act in the scene and not think about the finger that drew a line down the forehead and then wagged shame at her. Trying not to think about it now. Um, yeah, and I do wanna say too, you know, if somebody's already done work on their face, so what, so what? The real thing, the real goal for me, and I hope for others, is to just get rid of the fear that makes us think we had to do that to our faces, or makes us think we have to do more to our faces or any at all stuff to our faces. So, you know, and even if someone goes, okay, I dealt with that fear and I got rid of the root reasons why I'm doing this and they still wanna cut their face up, do it, it's fine. I'm just saying, let's get rid of the fear that makes us susceptible to those comments. Let's hear that comment. I can have, wait, let me find some of these comments. I, 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 I like hearing a comment. I like that I can hear a comment now and just go like, and just think, oh my God, you poor thing. You must think that way about yourself. You must, you must be having a very hard time with your own face. Um, Okay, let me find, I'm trying to find Donna. Donna, holy cow, I wish I had, I wish I had table contents. <laughs> That's my fault. Um, oh shoot, where is it? Oh, here we go, okay. So here are some of the comments about me on that uh, message board. Uh, let me find a good one. Uh, she looks like a witch. Uh, is she a smoker or a drug addict? I didn't think, oh. And there's some people says like, I don't think she looks so bad. Defending. Um, let's see, wait. Uh, I wanna find the one that's, uh, yeah, finally an actress who looks her age. Oh, that's not what 48, well, Dawn is 48. <laughs> that's what 48 looks like. I'm only eight years from that, heck no. Um, 
Wait, let me find the one. Oh, she looks like she smokes. Oh, and there's criticisms of my acting. <laughs> um, wait. Ah, shoot. There's just one really horrible, I'm trying to find this for you. Oh, it's earlier on. Hold on. Uh, oh, well, she, wait, let me see, that's not, that's not, that's good, but it's not the best one. Oh, uh, bitch got the AIDS, like I have AIDS. Um, and then, oh, she looks like Steven Tyler after a relapse on Peruvian Coke. That was the one. Anyway, it goes on and on. It's pretty funny. Uh, I feel bad for these people. Okay, where am I on time? All right, oh, I gotta tell you guys, it's so weird. All right, I'll read you one of my favorite ones. Now, there is a phenomenon that I have noticed where um, there could be like a woman who is attractive her whole life and then her look, you know, her face starts to get older. And then, um, and then there's this leapfrog thing where some women who were never really attractive, they'll start getting like the teeth whitening and the, the face stretching and everything. Everybody goes like, oh my God, she looks so amazing for 45. And meanwhile, you know, the other woman at 45 is like, she, you know, her, her, she used to be a 10, but now her number's gone down. And this other woman, now her number's gone up because so there's a phenomenon of like people feeling like that's cheating and God damn it, you know, you gotta like, you gotta take the descent too, you know? Anyway, this is about that. This is called Billy, 49 real estate agent. Billy resented Karen. Of course she did. Karen, porcelain, smooth skin, plump lips, spreading over stark white teeth, handing out cupcakes in exchange for the middle schools, the middle school kids' grimy dollar bills, smiling, flashing teeth, tossing brass hair, Ripe bosom threatening to splash out of the low neck of her cashmere sweater, leaning over the bake sale table and standing up, leaning over and standing up. Billy imagined the children would welcome Karen's full naked breasts as a righteous reminder of all that is life sustaining and necessary. The faculty and nearby parents would also, also greet these bare, gravity defying, lilac scented mounds as a sign from God that all is right with the world and that goodness prevails a rainbow after the rain. That's what Billy imagined would happen if Karen's goddamn fake tits fell out of her slutty neck sweater right now. Billy put her platter of Valentine's brownies on the bake sale table near Karen and pulled the cellophane off. A pastel colored candy heart was pressed into the top of each gooey square. Hubba hubba, kiss me, love you, you rock, dotted the darkness. Karen suddenly turned to Billy, her breasts, her hair, her face, big smile, big smile. Hi, Billy, big hug. How are you? We're here at the same time this year. I feel like we never have the same volunteer times. Billy focused on not letting her grin slip, on not letting her face telegraph her incredulity at the undisturbed surface of Karen's face. The absence of pores, creases, age spots, or sagging. It was smooth, as if a mask had been made from the skin of a baby and transplanted onto Karen. Oh, I, I think I'm relieving you. My time starts at two. Karen looked at her watch and Billy resented her for wearing one, for not just checking her phone for the time like everyone else. Oh, right, I didn't notice what time it was. Wow, that just flew by. Big smile, milk white teeth. Billy carefully let her grin grow. Yeah, I guess. A teacher tapped Karen on the shoulder and Karen turned to uh, direct her enthusiasm at him instead. Billy looked at the back of Karen's head for a moment. She wanted to ask her about her face. She wanted to ask her about before the first time, before the procedures piled up and became too hard for Billy to keep track of, if before the first time, if Karen was worried ab about what could happen, worried that it could go terribly wrong, that she'd look in the mirror afterwards at awkwardly stretched cheeks, a glossy forehead and comically swollen lips and re regret it all. Did Karen worry that she'd wind up sobbing on her chicken, on her chicken? 
on her kitchen floor, making bargains with God to go back in time and reverse the surgery, swear on her children's lives that she'd never be ungrateful for her face again, never complain about the bags or the jowls or the thin lips or the heavy eyelids. Billy wanted to ask Karen if she had ever, ever had a moment of terror like that, or even a moment of concern that others would afterwards not take her seriously, that they would be stuck in the uncanny valley of buoyant breasts, a velvety face and golden hair on the frame of a 50-year-old woman. Billy instead looked down at her brownies and turned them with the heart's text facing the student customers across the table. She, she, she knew she could never have plastic surgery. She'd be too worried of something going wrong, of looking worse than before. Even if the surgery was a success, she'd feel like she was lying to everyone she encountered and would have to watch them silently accept the lie of an unlined face as if she were a retarded child wearing a Halloween costume every day that the townspeople politely accommodate by not mentioning it. Yes, a dollar a piece. Billy took $3 from the girls and pushed the money into the wide slit of the metal cash box. The girls giggled and, gla and grabbed the kiss me, no way, and ask me brownies. Here you go, Billy held out some napkins imprinted with pink hearts. The girls grinned and one shook her head no. Karen was further away now. Billy could see her near the drink stand at the gym door, talking to another parent. Karen was laughing at something the other woman said and placed a manicured hand briefly on her shoulder. Billy wanted to punch Karen in the mouth. Billy had been wronged. She felt cheated. Billy had been beautiful and was still to some, but Karen did not grow up beautiful, was not beautiful as a child, nor as a teen. Oh, not as a teen, not as a young adult. Billy knew this. Karen had been average, a seven, Billy knew. Billy, on the other hand, had been a 10, considered a 10 for years. As Billy aged though, she felt like her ranking fell, nine, eight, seven, six. And all things being equal, Karen's seven of years past should be a three right now by Billy's account, a fucking three. But Karen cheated, that's what pissed Billy off. Karen fucking cheated. Breast implants, facelift, teeth whitening, hair bleaching, Karen fucking hit the nitro button on her car and passed Billy, fucking cheated. Karen looks amazing for her age and all that bullshit, fucking ass three posing as a seven. I better get out of here before I start eating the merchandise. Karen was now next to Billy at the table, putting it, pulling an apron over her head and laughing at her own joke. Billy smiled and nodded. Karen handed her the apron. You want this? The stiff red cotton was choked in Karen's fist behind her pale pink charmed nails. Billy looked at the nails for a moment and wanted to break half of them off. She looked up at Karen. Sure. Karen fluffed her hair and, ex and exhaled loudly. <sighs> okay. She reached for her purse under the bake sale table. Billy, you should come along next time we have a mom's night out. I'm chairing that committee now, so I get to pick the bar. Karen winked, or she seemed to wink. She was moving away now, pawing through her bag in search of her car keys. Let me know when you, where you want to go. The next one's in March. Karen then looked up at Billy, smiled widely, and waved the entirety of her arm. Fuck you, Karen, Billy said under her breath as she smiled a smile to match Karen's and waved back just as big. So in a lot of these stories, like, I'm not saying one person's wrong and the other person's right, or I'm just saying, like, that happens, you know? Is Karen wrong for doing all that? I don't know, she seems pretty happy, you know? Is Billy wrong for resenting her? You know, life's easier when you don't resent people. <laughs> but, um, you know, so the book is like, you know, got stories that are like that. Like, here's what's, here's what's going on and here's why that seems to be going on. Um, let's see, I think I have like, Four more, four more. I'll, I'll read you another one. Okay. This is, I really like this one. I mean, I like them all. I wrote them, but whatever. Okay, Gloria, 89, dead. And I hope this isn't, I hope we're still on. Like, I, I hope this isn't like a phone call where you keep talking and talking and the other person, <laughs> the call got dropped. All right, I'm going to assume you're still there. Uh, Gloria, 89, dead. One square foot. That's what Gloria figured it measured, one square foot. She had bought shirts and tablecloths and baby blankets and bed sheets and fabric for curtains. 
and so many yards of fabric, so many square feet, and none of them much mattered. One square foot, what was that? Something just big enough to place a pair of shoes on, something you could rest a bowling ball on, nothing. Standing there or hovering, floating, drifting, she couldn't tell, looking at her face. They had made it up, nice, she supposed, but not really her style, too much blush. Standing there looking at her face, one square foot, really, of skin. That's all it was, nothing. And yet it had dominated her life, so much of it, one square foot. It seemed so bizarre to Gloria now, so positively foreign. She almost couldn't relate to it at all. She could remember though, could remember being consumed with it, couldn't remember why. One square foot of skin had demanded her attention almost always, had dictated her mood every day had ruined her time alive, really. One square foot. Not the larger piece of skin on her arms or legs, not the relatively enormous cylinder of skin on her back and chest, just what was on her face. Just the top of the bag of skin in which her bones and organs and nerves and brain were held. Just the top, nothing else. She remembers being paralyzed by it, by how she looked, how it looked, how it would be perceived how she might be treated as a result of its condition, its arrangement, a mood ring really, the day's mood predicated on others' reactions to it, buoyed up by any co uh, compliment on its tone or color when she was younger, glowing, radiant, so pretty today. And then for most of her life, unhappy. So unhappy because of the lack of those com comments, a slide away from that, a long, increasingly dark period of worry, worry that it wasn't right anymore, that she wasn't right anymore, that her only admission ticket into that her only admission ticket into happiness, into what made other people happy to see her, was continuously disintegrating. Everything else in her life was fine, was expanding, she supposed, was good and fine, but that square foot of skin was shifting like sand, a long overnight blowing of sand off the beach and into the ocean, changed while the beach hotel guests slept. Then them slipping down to the shoreline in the early morning to claim their beach chairs and noticing, hey, the beach looks different. It was something like that. Something you could do nothing about. Something that happened while you were out, asleep, not paying attention. Something that changed. She remembered how her face had dominated her thoughts, all of them really, so much time spent. She suddenly stopped thinking about it. She instead looked at her daughter and husband, her daughter and son, her grandson, her husband in the first and second rows in front, in front of the casket. She didn't feel sad, just marveled at their movements, their lives, the smells she knew they were smelling, the food they would taste at the wake, the baths they, would take, they may take later, the books they would now read, the movies they'd see, the triumphs they would experience. She wanted to touch all that suddenly, wanted to put it on like a, put it on like a large animal pelt, a bear skin maybe, and then lie down on the ground and roll around in it cherry blossom trees and strawberry jam and knitting and car races and mathematical equations, rocket launches and jazz music. She wanted to gather it all between herself and the bearskin pelt and then pull the pelt close like a burrito or a cocoon so that all of it would soak into her in a way that hadn't when she was alive, the way it hadn't then. Her girlfriends were there four rows back, sitting together, old like her, huddled together, one scared, one resigned, one bitter huddled together like birds in a zoo, half aware of their unique qualities, the one that had caused their selection for this the zoo, and also fully aware of the distractingly restrictive qualities of their surroundings, something that did not at all match the place from whence they'd been snatched. Too painful. Gloria knew they felt their faces remained on them like a copy of a copy of a copy of the original image, corroded from the inside with disappointment and disbelief that the world had stopped being impressed by their one square foot of skin. And so early too, before 40 for most of them. Gloria turned away, so much lost time. She couldn't look at people, her friends anymore, still doing it, still in the throes of that obsession with their face. So much authority turned over, absolutely turned over to others. Why had Gloria done it? So much time lost. So many opportunities not taken, so many unhappy moments left unredeemed. Oh, so many happy moments left unredeemed like lottery tickets left in a drawer. She could almost touch the sorrow out over that, 
She could see it resting there as a glowing bundle nearby, close enough to touch if she wanted, but far enough to justify the choice of simply wanting, of simply watching it dissolve. She wanted to touch it though, just a bit, like wanting to feel the labor pains before the epidural is injected, just a touch. She reached out and felt a piercing through her spirit like a cleaver into a coconut, splitting the hard shell and meat and releasing the water inside. She withdrew her hand quickly, resolved now to just watch it disappear instead, a tidy bag of ash from a furnace of self-loathing and voluntary exclusion from life. She was glad to watch it go and was relieved to never again have to think of things like that, to have other experiences now, she assumed, unrelated to society and the limitations within that. What a funny thing it was though, to have, had, to have let that one square foot of skin distract her so utterly from the experiences of her life. Uh, so, okay, am I on time? Good. Thank you so much for um, sharing those passages from your book and for writing the book. Uh, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great collection. We have about half a dozen questions that have been coming mm -hmm. in through the chat. So you started this um, talk by talking about fear. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll say, I'll preface this by saying that the person who contributed this comment and question said she agrees that we do not need to fix ourselves. Uh, and she's wondering, do you think there's some rational basis for fears of women around aging? There seems to be evidence that aging females do experience real discrimination in the workplace and beyond. Um. I mean, that's pretty, that's, you know, not knowing anyone's specific situation, which, I mean, I can only speak to my own situations. Um, I feel that uh, there's always going to be some conflict. There's always going to be some energy force person, whatever, trying to push against what's available to me um, and trying to sow seeds of doubt in me. Um, so I just have to, if I'm, if, if I were in a situation where I'm trying to get a job and they're like, no, I don't need to know the reason why. If they justify it to themselves by telling themselves that it's because I'm older, to me, to me, I feel like the direction in my life is uh, not governed by what those people think they think. It's, if it's a no, then I don't need to know the reason. It's just a no, it just means that I would not have a good time working there. I would not have, it just means like go for the next person. And I've had many situations where, you know, like getting funding for, you know, my film Violet that's um, yeah, out tomorrow online, if people wanna see it. Um, I took uh, hustling every single day for 18 months. And could I look at some of the no's and assume that that was because I'm an older female? I don't know, I guess. Like, what does that get me? So I'd rather just go, okay, bye, next, 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 and get to my, my pot of gold, you know, get to my, I mean, in that case, literally, like get to my money. <laughs> But you know, get to the goal. So that's just how I handle it. Um, I think there are some uh, built-in, perhaps it's just a theory. I'm not an anthropologist, but I think there are some built-in reasons in our DNA that go back to like a tribal level. Um, it's again, like I said, it's just a theory. But you know, when you are um, when you are uh, able to bear children and you look like you're able to bear children that could be of greater value to a tribe than an older woman possibly so that's possibly baked into us but then once we know that then we can go oh but that was back when you really had to depend on somebody you know like felling a deer or something and bringing it back to the tribe but now I can just walk down to you know a grocery store and just buy what I need so I find in, 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 I don't know, to me, when somebody's being sexist or ageist or whatever they're doing, they're telling me about them. They're not telling me about me. 
they're not telling me about my worth. They're telling me they're, they're really exposing to me how they think of themselves. But I think whatever directions I want to go in, um, there's going to be someone who's going to say yes. So I don't know. That's how I live it. Um, yeah. Is there real sexism? Is there real age discrimination? Is there real racism? Is there? Yeah, there is. But I have this much time on earth. So I'm not going to, I don't want to take the, I don't want the job of trying to change all these people. I just want to change how I'm going through life so that I can have the best time possible. Is there a movement within the entertainment industry to embrace aging naturally? How do we shift the cultural and societal norms around uh, gender and age discrimination that are rampant? Why? I mean, let me ask that question. If, if I had that desire to change everybody around me, I would want that so that that just for, for me, I don't mean to be answering for this, the person who asked the question, just for me. I would want that so that I wouldn't have to work so hard at, at my own mindset. I would want that so that uh, approval is reflected around me all around. What I, what I like about doing it this way is that I can get there. I can get to that full confidence without anyone around me changing. I don't like the odds of whether or not other people are gonna change. So if somebody wants to see older women in film, make a film, put older women in it. Like, uh, you know, there's 47 short stories in Face. Uh, I've written that adaptation for 14 of them um, that I'm gonna make a movie out of. I just have to raise the money for it. But, and you know, most of the women in there are older. I mean, I think, I think older women are rad on camera. Like you, the, the, the emotional, you just have to barely move your face. And like, there's just a lot of information comes through which is what you want from an actor. Um, but will it change on the outside? I don't know. I don't really care if it does personally. I just wanna keep doing what I'm doing. I wanna keep putting like really interesting people on camera. Um, I want to continue to, you know, become as confident as possible and enjoy my time. So I don't know, is society gonna, all of society, it's a lot of people. Are they all gonna shift and change and love older women's faces? I don't care. I don't know. <laughs> um, how much response have you had from men about your book and what has that response been like, if any? Uh, mostly women, I did get some from, um, uh, interestingly, the gay community is like, wow, yeah, we really have an issue with this. Um, but I feel, and I, and I had, and I interviewed some guys too about that. And, and I feel like it was such a, um, there was so much depth to what they were saying that I feel like it deserves a book of its own. So I didn't include, uh, that stuff. Um, but there's that aspect to it. And then I had, uh, a couple of DMs from people, uh, men who said, you know, one guy was saying that his wife was um, very, they'd been married for 40 years or something and she was really committed to getting a facelift. And he was like devastated because he doesn't want her to change her face. I mean, it's the face he's loved for 40 years. Um, so that, and he just said that he had seen an interview I did when the book came out and he said, I'm buying the book in hopes that she'll change her mind. So that was like, mm. um, yeah, reactions like that. And then, yeah. Uh, another question that came in that's related um, to gender. Do you have any thoughts about whether or not there's a double standard about the aging of men, particularly actors? Um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, it kind of goes back to that, that tribal example I gave. The, uh, you know, an older man, and again, this is just a theory. And, you know, if someone thinks it helps to explain things, then cool. If not, you know, just throw it out. But a man who's older, and, and especially in our society now, where you don't even have to be 
you know, strong enough to go fell a deer for the tribe, right? But you could just, you know, you have, you're a provider because perhaps you're, you're very wealthy or you have a career or you're, um, and it's also, it's interesting to think about the roles that, that society likes to have filled. Um, they like to fill that role with somebody of the older wise man, not, old, not even older wise man suggests he's like 80 or 90 years old, but just like the head of the company, the, the dad that gets everything done for us, you know, the, the provider, the, we want, we want people to play that role. So I think we, I think we cast we, we like to assume that older men know what they're doing because it makes our, um, it completes our, our, our play or our film and our lives. You know what I mean? It makes, it's like, okay, somebody's playing that role good. I feel, I feel safe. I feel secure. I feel like things are okay. Um, which is why it's far more disappointing when a guy like that turns out to be like a, a complete charlatan or something. You know, everybody feels betrayed. Um, when it's like, well, maybe it's because you assumed a lot of him to begin with because of the role you wanted him to play. Um, yeah, and I think, I think people have complicated relationships with females and who females all, you know, what females represent to their lives. You know, if you're told as a, as a little boy that um, if, if the worst thing you could do is throw like a girl, or cry like a girl, or look like a girl, then as you get older, and then let's say you didn't really pay much attention to that, but it just went in there subliminally, and then you get older, and you're working at a company, and you work in a particular position, and you're doing well, and, um, and then some, a woman gets hired to come in and be sort of at your level in that company. Now you're on par with your worst case scenario. It's just something to think about. It's just, and I say all these things to say like, hey, if we can understand what we have, sub that we have unconsciously absorbed, then we can go like, oh, that's why I'm doing it, you know? And then you feel like, oh, I don't need to do that anymore. Because the first, the first comment, you know, that I heard as a child was a lie. I mean, it's interesting, right? It's not like, oh, you throw like a dog. It's like you throw like a girl, like that's the worst. So, and that's, some, that's something that I think, uh, you know, be good for adults to not not say to little boys. It's a it sets a bad framework up for them later. Um, yeah, I know. I I feel like I'm going off on a tangent a little bit here, but uh, yeah, there's. I don't know if I call it double standard as much as a different role. And do you ever notice in films in the future? Uh, women kick ass, like films that are set in the future, you know, sci-fi films, women are president, you know, they're the president or they're the leader of the universe or whatever, or they're beating everybody up or figuring everything out. So maybe that's our future, I don't know, whatever. Male, female, I think it's just a, just a matter of what type of people they are rather than it just being male or female, but um, yeah, in films, definitely. Yeah, she's right. It's, uh, you know, if you're an older guy, uh, you work longer and, um, you know, I don't know, it's a chicken or the egg, you know, uh, filmmaking is a, the film business is a business. So are they giving people, are they giving you older men and smooth, ska, smooth skinned woman, women because that's what they want you to eat? Or are you eating it because, or are you paying to eat it because, or are they making it because that's the only thing you'll pay to eat? So a couple uh, other questions. Mm -hmm. Women perpetuate judgment, violence, and self-loathing that we've internalized from the media on other women. It's like judging others before we're judged. What have you found to be some of the best ways to work with fear and the nature of the mind around the issue of aging? Um. See Violet, I think you'll enjoy it because it gets into like, uh, it's, um, it's about um, uh, the critical thoughts we have in the voice we call it the, the, or in the film we call it the voice. 
um, that cause us to make fear-based decisions? And how do you become somebody whose life is um, based in fear-based decisions to a life that's made of instinct-based decisions? So they might like that film. Um, yeah, I always, I mean, I have sort of a true north for myself and I can feel like if I'm, if I'm behaving in a way that's not myself and usually it's like um, an insecure way or in a selfish way, or a, I could just feel like, oh, I just did that thing or I just wore that thing or I said that thing or something and that wasn't me. I didn't really wanna be saying that or I didn't really wanna be wearing that or doing that or whatever. And then I have to go into, I have to say, okay, what was happening just before that? Or I felt okay until certain situation. And then I got to look at what did it bring up in me? So an example is like, you know, I felt okay until that one thing like yesterday. I don't know, was it last night? I don't remember. And then I tried, okay, no, let's really pin, pinpoint the moment. Okay, I was at that party. I felt okay. I didn't feel myself after the party. All right, what happened at the party? Well, I felt okay until, oh, I felt okay until that girl came in, that girl in the red dress. All right, well, what happened at that moment? Oh, well, she came in and I suddenly felt competitive and, and uh, um, critical of myself. And um, okay, well, what was the fear? Then, then that's what I, then I have to get really into what fear came up in me. What did I think I was not gonna get in life because she just walked in? And for me, it's almost always an irrational fear. And I have to write it down or say it out loud before my rational mind judges it or, or you know, tries to go like, ah, oh, no, 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 That's, that doesn't make any sense. Don't say that, don't, or don't write that. But I have to, my rational mind can't see it properly until I get it out. So I really want to get at that irrational fear. Like, oh, I'm fear that, uh, fear that I won't be provided for because she's gonna take all the resources because all the guys are paying attention to her. Now my rational mind can look at it and go, huh, am I really gonna lose resources? Really? Or is that, that's not true. Then I would tell myself, no, I'll always have as many resources as I, as I want. So then next time, that type of girl walks in in a red dress and I start to feel that I can go, oh, no, no, no. That's about fear of having resources, but I have all my resources. Why don't I go over and introduce myself? You know, whatever, just as an example, right? It's that kind of digging that I personally have found works. It, it sounds like uh, naming the emotion, naming the fear or the issue can be helpful. Uh, this is the last question that I'll give you. Social media is far more aggressive and critical than gossip tabloids. How did you channel either your anger or your clarity to resist the toxic messages that came through social media to flip the narrative about beauty and aging for yourself? Um, I think it was, uh, well, the first step, like I said, was getting to the root reason that it bothered me. Like, did, did you guys ever, um, when I was a kid, they would, at school, they'd give us these red tab, they'd, they'd have us brush our teeth and then they'd give us these red tablets to chew. And then the, the, the red uh, dye would stick to the places where you hadn't really brushed well. So I always feel like it's one of those things. Like if I hear a comment, if I see something about myself and it really, it really hits me in my, in my spirit, then I'm like, okay, why? Why did that hit me in my spirit? Let's go find out. And I write about it, like I just said. And then, so once I've dealt with it about myself, then I can look at this person objectively and go, oh, wow, you must be in like a hell hole right now. You know, that that's how, you know, you're, I think somebody touched on it maybe in the, a couple of questions ago where somebody feels sad about themselves. They're beating themselves up. They're, you know, they're ripped up by fears themselves and want to attack other people who, um, to kind of make themselves in a way, try and try and make themselves feel better, but also attack anyone who seems confident. Cause it's like, wait, I'm following the rules. I'm following the rules of telling myself my face looks like shit and I need to get it fixed, but you're not, your face is wrinkled. You should have to feel bad about yourself too. You know, I think there's a bit of that as well, but, but it's not until I deal with my own irrational fears, my, the, my, the reasons why it struck me. 
then then after that i can i can look at them objectively and 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 block them <laughs> on social media you know just like block them you know just send them to the you know it's it's sad and and oftentimes if you go to their 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 accounts you'll see they're doing this with lots of people like you're not so special you know what i mean it's not just it's not about you but you know i think it's I think it's a really um, important time for females, males too, but especially in the department of looks, it's a really important time, I think, for females to get to their root fears of why they feel affected by any of these things because there's never been a time in all of human history, I think I can safely say this, never been a time where the group you compare yourself to is as wide as it is right now. It used to be you compare yourself, you know, as you get, you know, to your your schoolmates, your your classmates, and then your schoolmates, and then maybe the people in your town, and then you know, as you get older, your world expands, and especially if you get into a position of, uh, you know, in a Fortune 500 company or something, maybe you're comparing yourself to a lot of people in the in in the world, but still, it's it's limited, right? But now you're comparing yourself to every girl, woman, female, who's got an Instagram account. And you're comparing yourself to every girl in all of time. You're comparing yourself to a bunch of dead people too, you know? I mean, that was always sort of the case, but, but now, I don't know, there's a, there's a whole thing that's interesting to me about when things are in context in old magazines and stuff that you'd see like at the, you know, at the manicurist or the doctor's office or something, but now they're not, in that context, they're brought to now. So it's as if it's happening right now. So there's a, if someone is prone to compare themselves to others, this is a bad time for them. But if they can get to the root fear of why they'd be doing that comparison, then it'll go easier. Justine, I couldn't thank you enough for being here at Town Hall with us tonight. Your perspective is very refreshing and I, I could imagine it's more than relatable for everyone that was here tonight. So thank you for your vulnerability and thank you for spending the night with us. Yes, and I thank you everybody for coming. I'm sorry I couldn't see your faces. Your faces, face. 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 (laughs) But um, I would just say like, there's there's nothing wrong with your face. And um, when you think about it, it's almost like, it almost seems like a spiritual conspiracy to get half the population who's at an age where they know what the hell they're doing and they've got the connections to make things happen to distract them into not doing any of that. So don't let that keep you from doing all the things you're gonna do because there's nothing wrong with your face. Hashtag. Nothing wrong with your face. face. And speaking of face, um, to our audience at home, remember to pick up a copy from our friends over at Third Place Books and check out Violet in theaters tomorrow. Um, well, in theaters now, but it'll be online tomorrow. So even more people can find it. Even more people can find it. You heard it from Justine herself. Justine, thank you so much. And everyone at home, have a great night.